Hi, Keith. Hello, well, Andrea. <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. And I really look forward to our conversation and getting to know you better. And um, you have some very interesting things to share. So I can't wait to share that with other people. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Good. So um, I don't even have my questions near me. <laughs> So um, we're going to talk about loving the shadow, right? That was something that um, felt near and dear to you that you brought up. And um, where are we going to start with that? I guess maybe how do I feel about loving the shadow? We were kind of talking about that off air, right? You asked me how my holiday season had been and I was telling you that um, it was challenging personally and there were some things that I had to overcome right um, and there were things that I didn't particularly love about it so um, I'm thinking that that's maybe a, a way into talking about loving the things that come up and not really always loving that. So maybe we can start there. Like, do you have some insight, some personal strategy, some tools that you use personally when there are some aspects of you that are coming up throughout the day or in your interactions with people and um, you're, you know, not necessarily loving all the parts that you see, right? Yeah. 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 So, right. We're talking about the shadow. Yes. And the shadow is a concept that comes from Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. And the idea of it is that it's an aspect of our psyche in which we mostly unconsciously place things that we don't want to look at or aren't ready to fully go into uh, or otherwise are averse to exploring. And oftentimes this accumulation of things in the shadow begins in childhood before our ego is fully developed where we don't necessarily know what to do with these aspects. And so we, we stuff them in this dark area and then lo and behold, later in life, these things confront us and we have to face them. Mm -hmm. And so to love the shadow is to really, it's, it is, it's to love all of the aspects of ourselves. Self. Right. And so you're speaking to these challenges happening in your life and the um, kind of paradox of it is you don't have to love everything that happens to you right because <laughs> some things are strictly challenging or or dark or bad or however we want to categorize them um but to the extent that it makes us feel like there is something wrong internally that's the the point that we have to lovingly reframe so that we can not be carrying something within us that that we don't need to be carrying and so we can face those aspects of ourselves the shadow aspects of ourselves with open eyes and say i love you you're part of me let's put you into your proper place so that we're not moving through the world feeling like um, the world is out to get us or that uh, these shadow elements are simply pulling us down. Mm -hmm. Or being in the victim mentality or blaming mm, yes. the world around us, right? That keeps us really stuck because we don't have a chance to take any responsibility for what is going on with us if we are consistently, you know, focused on how the rest of the world is impacting us. Mm. Not to say that the rest of the world isn't impacting us, but how we can show up to that, I think is really, yeah, 
key or instrumental. So how did you get into Carl Jung's work? How about that? Yeah, it, I think initially it, I came to his work by just kind of seeing his name popping up from different sources, from different people who I was interested in their work. Mm. And so there was this confluence of, oh, all of these roads are leading back to Jung. And so I have to check this guy out. And he was someone who, you know, he he attained quite a, a following during his lifetime. And at the same time, he was, I think, quite ahead of his time mm -hmm. to where people didn't fully accept his his psychological theories because they were kind of out, out there. there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he was a disciple of Freud and then took a hard swerve away from him. And Freud was kind of dominating the psychological landscape. Mm -hmm. But now there's this emergence of interest in this man's work. And some of it is real out there. And but it's infinitely fascinating. And I think he went deeper into the psyche than anyone anyone else that I can point to. And I see his work show up a lot with men's work, mm. which I think is interesting. Um, I was introduced to Carl Jung, surprisingly, in high school, which was really lucky on my part. Wow. But because I took a world religions class. And uh, it's funny because I was just talking about this on a podcast uh, episode earlier this week that <clears throat> that was kind of my way out of religion, right? For me, that was my aha moment because I had, you know, internally decided that people thought differently. And I was in such a sheltered environment that I was like, yes, these people. You know, it was confirmation for me that, you know, there was someone in the world that really, um, yeah, thought differently about how we should be. Mm. And um, I think the aspect of the men's part, right, um, I really, in my 30s, was in therapy quite often. And um, I got introduced to David Dida's work. And, um, yeah, I feel like they're, you know, he, I think some of his work is based upon that strategy or that belief system or, yeah, the philosophy behind Carl Jung's work. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Carl Jung, but it obviously impacted you enough that it influences the work that you do, too, and you work with men primarily. Do you always just work with men? No, not not only. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but you do lead a men's group, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so is that, how does that, or how do you <clears throat> incorporate what you've learned through Carl Jung in your work today? Yeah. Yeah. So I run a group, a program that is called the integrated man and the idea of integration is something that in part i can attribute to the the jungian stuff the but it's around this idea of wholeness mm -hmm. and that wholeness is a healing function mm -hmm. and we are all already whole so it's not something that we need to seek for because it's already there but integration in the way that i think about it is we're taking all of the parts of ourselves and we're aligning them in a harmonious way so you can think about it as you know moons orbiting a planet or um the swirl of a galaxy or you know, however you want to think about it. But oftentimes we feel very disjointed or like there's aspects of us that are flung far out. And so we move through the world and we don't feel an internal sense of harmony. 
we don't feel that experience of that wholeness that is is innate is our birthright and so to become integrated is to bring all of those parts and and the shadow being one of them and seeing them yeah and seeing them and welcoming them in and finding the place for them so that you can come into proper alignment and if we can be in proper alignment then we're sturdy you know if we're uh if we have these parts of us flung flung far out and a great weight is placed upon us then we might collapse but if we're in alignment and a great weight is placed upon us then we have our best chance of remaining sturdy and carrying the weight and so that's that's one of the main ways that i utilize the the Jungian idea of one's wholeness and integration of all of the parts in order to help men to come into alignment with themselves. Okay. So full integration, what does that look like? How do you encourage men to do this? Um, you know, as opposed to being fragmented. So I had a question about that, yeah. Mm. So um, culturally, you feel that men are taught emotional suppress suppression. And so, yeah, how do you encourage men to get in better alignment or integrate all the aspects of themselves, right? How do you go about doing that? I know how I do it with women, but mm. men, are, men are different, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, there's many ways, but one way of thinking about integration, the, it's the same root as the word integrity. And so we know what being in integrity feels okay. like. Yeah. Right. And if you're moving through the world in integrity, you feel, you feel sturdy, you feel yourself. Mm -hmm. And one of the simple or most basic not simple but most basic alignments is is your are your, are your thoughts in alignment with your actions and the words that you're speaking into the world and so these are three parts that we can pull together and say i am in integrity all the way through this particular axis my thoughts my behaviors and my words, what I'm speaking into the world, are in alignment. If if you can do that, then you're taking a huge step toward overall integration because then you're not lying to yourself. You're not moving through the world deceptively and you're honoring yourself and everyone you come into contact with simply by doing that that one axis of alignment mm -hmm. or being more authentic yes right mm -hmm. and authenticity is the is the aim in in a sense it's all it all comes down to uh you know jung talked about this idea of individuation which is ultimately becoming who you are so it's truly inhabiting your authentic self and that that is the highest degree of integration so agreed speaking the truth is a huge huge move in that direction that alone will change people's lives mm -hmm. yeah especially if other people have expectations of you or you were raised where you don't feel like you can completely be yourself or mm. you have a a you know, partner who expects certain things out of you that maybe was great in a commitment 20 years ago, but you've changed or you weren't even authentic when you made that commitment. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah, it happens. Yeah, uh, it absolutely does. It happens a lot more often than probably we want to all admit. Yeah, yeah. So really stripping down, I feel, or unraveling the things that Mm, we've accumulated over time the patterns of belief that we either taught to behave or react 
in a certain way and really doing self-inquiry about why, why do I, um, why do I react that way? Or why is that having that reaction in me? Or why um, did I commit to that when it wasn't really honest? Or why I ask myself why a lot. You could tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, getting very curious about, you know, um, getting very curious about myself helps me be more authentic, I would say. Mm. Yeah or show up authentically or more embodied or more aligned or more integrated um, because otherwise I'm just kind of walking around asleep, right? Just yeah. acting and reacting and, and not really checking in with, is that my real truth, right? And um, we can't be doing that 100% of the time, of course. Um, I'm not perfect, but more often than not, I spend a lot of time in reflection, right? So it sounds like you too, and you're encouraging men to do and speak about things that normally men, you know, and I don't want to generalize, but men in general are less apt to have conversations about their feelings or burden someone with their feelings mm. or burden someone with their truth, right? <laughs> Because they're like, no, 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 we have a good setup here. And I, you know, I've committed to this and I, you know, don't want to rock the boat or, yeah, deal with all of the emotions that come along with the female counterpart, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, you mentioned the emotional suppression. And I think that that can be attributed to a lot of things. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, one is that it's it's almost more... Uh, what we're not taught than what we are taught. Okay. Um, because the the default state of a human being is to release one's emotions. Like mm -hmm. babies are crying all the time in order to advocate for what they need in the only way they know how. And it's just this pure emotional release and babies giggling and laughing. And, you know, it's these pure emotional releases and so it's a default way of being but then you know we're we're not taught as men oftentimes that that is good <laughs> that that's good and so and then oftentimes we are taught that it's not good and the being a little boy and you fall and you scrape your knee and you start crying and the line is like, man up. Yeah. Which, what does that mean? Man up. Yeah. It's really poisonous because it creates this false ideal that actually doesn't serve anybody. It's like, what do you mean man up? To man up is to bury something and pretend I don't feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is this is the shadow. We bury things that we don't want to look at and they don't go away. Mm -hmm. They emerge in other ways. Mm -hmm. And so if we're constantly repressing our own emotional state, mm -hmm. then that's going to emerge in some way, whether it's through a, a, anger or yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes men are susceptible to outbursts of anger for sure and that does a lot of damage mm -hmm. when maybe if we're just shown that if you're hurt you can cry and that's good then you're not having that buildup of pressure that's going to be released on someone who doesn't deserve it yeah i'll never forget um a psychiatrist that i worked with in my 30s told me that I had an anger management problem. <clears throat> so I'll speak on my own, mm. uh, you know, story. But with regards to that, she said, um, you know, how to manage it. You just reminded me, uh, think of yourself as like a Coke bottle that's been shaken up. 
And she's like, when you see one bottle rise, to, I mean, one bubble rise to the top, like that's when you should be doing something. And I teach other people, you know, in my program or one on one, like anger is a warning system in your body. It's like an alarm going off. And anger isn't necessarily wrong. There's nothing wrong with anger. There's a lot of passion or energy behind anger that can be used or utilized or channeled into advocating for something or feeling really strongly about something or great movement behind something, right? But when I don't know how to express it, when I'm constantly told, okay, man up or, you know, honey, you don't, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay, before you even have a chance to share why you might be upset, right? right. If you do fall down, that um, you constantly, you know, can't recognize the bubbles. You can't recognize when you first start to get angry or when you first are starting to push stuff down until it gets to a place of explosion, explosion, especially if in your family, that's how anger was dealt with, or that's how emotions were dealt with, right? It's, it's also modeled to us too in our childhood. It's not just being told repeatedly, you know, every time you fall down or every time you have a worry or concern, honey, you're okay. Or, you know, overriding your feelings. It's, it's also, you know, uh, how mom and dad dealt with anger too, especially I would imagine. I mean, you can speak to this more than I can because I was a girl, but, or I still am, but you know, that, that you look to your dad for how he deals with his emotions too. And if your dad is not capable or was never shown emotional regulation or was never shown how to express themselves, especially in relationship to your mom, it's going to be really hard for you to learn that unless you go out of that nucleus, right? Mm -hmm. And educate yourself or go to therapy or, you know, learn it from someone else. Yeah. 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 And that tends to be how it is. And fortunately, we're living in an age where there is a lot of curiosity around this stuff and around how to process emotions in a healthy way. And uh, there's a lot of resources out there. And things that my parents' generation and their parents and their parents didn't have access, access to. to. Yeah. yeah, we are fortunate that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're even fortunate in the work that we do because, you know, 30 years ago, that would be different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so how did emotional suppression impact you personally when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think it was more so in what was not said or you mentioned the modeling that that being a great teacher um but yeah i can remember being a boy and a lot of this is coming from our peer groups too and we're modeling these behaviors we don't even understand and young boys can be really ruthless with one another mm, you guys like to tease a lot yeah and right and and joke around and make fun of each other and you know especially with emotions right yes mm -hmm. and that often becomes the mask for one's own emotional insecurities is oh i i don't want to be the target of this ridicule so i'm going to target and this is a trap that i fell into and a trap that a lot of uh boys and young men fall into is Oh, if I'm, I'm constantly making a joke out of everything or, you know, bullying or teasing somebody else, then I'm not going to have to look at my own. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Again, focus being outside of you, right? And then yeah. how can you change, right? Right. Defer the focus. And then <laughs> I don't need to face my own sadness that I'm facing inside or my own insecurity. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's unfortunate. And again, I think that's that's shifting in the younger generation even today. You do feel like it's shifting. I do. I mean, I you know, I don't have uh, a lot of contact with you know like high school age boys, so I don't know what it's like in those spaces these days. But 
I imagine because of this emergence of this self-reflectiveness that is just happening more on a cultural scale, that that is trickling into these spaces and people are, these, these boys are relying less on uh, just cruelty and, or even just deferring by means of joking and are hopefully able to converse more about it and work things out that way. Hmm. 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 Yeah. I mean, I don't have studies or statistics on that, but I do wonder, I mean, I feel like teenage boys go through, I mean, teenage girls go through a lot, but, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like in some ways we are more connected and more resourced than we've ever been. We have the ability to um, do personal development or to research things or to watch a YouTube video, but I don't know how much that's going to override what I'm being taught at home mm. yet. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, it may not even occur to me to go outside of my family and to look, right? Yeah. Yeah. And not also, until much later. Yeah. There's also so much information out there and a lot of it is contradictory. And so yes. I can imagine that too. It's difficult to pour through it. I mean, even as a critical thinking adult, it's difficult to pour through all the information <laughs> that's out there and yeah. make sense of it. So that could also be an occurrence is that it leads to more confusion in the youth. I don't know. Do you find from your own pers personal experience of growing into who you are now, do you find that there was a particular age for you where you got more curious about doing this work yourself? For me, it wasn't until I turned 30 and feeling like I was trapped in this extended adolescence, feeling like a boy, not feeling like a man and not understanding why. And so setting myself out on a quest to figure it out, like what is missing here? And it's, and that's one of the reasons that I choose to work with men is because I don't want that to be the norm. And it has been, is this extended adolescent phase where, uh, men in their 20s and 30s and even beyond get stuck in this inner sense of feeling like a boy and not feeling like a man because they were not taught, they were not shown. And it's unfortunate that I had to kind of figure it out on my own, but it also is, it's beautiful because it's brought me to where I am and brought me to my own inner sense of sturdiness and uh, strength and awareness and all of these things that I really value about myself. So the, the journey um, being something that I had to undertake on my own also brought with it a reward. However, having no guidance at all is not the way. So hopefully we can, and again, hopefully this is shifting in the world is that this sense of this extended adolescence that lingers way too long is dissipating or that's transforming. And young men are learning how to step into that, that inner sense of, of alignment and that sense of feeling like a man. So how does it present, because you can speak to this better than I do, how does it present, or at least for you or the people that you work with, if you don't want to make it about you, how does it present when you are, let's say, in your 30s and you are feeling like a boy inside, but you're expected to be a man? What do you mean by that? Can you break that down a little bit better? I mean more. Yeah. I would, I would say it's kind of... Um, for me, it was a sense of being wayward, being lost and wandering and not knowing what I was aiming toward and the kind of helplessness that is inherent in that way of being. And that 
it was a lot to to face that and so i didn't want to face it and you know this is a lot of uh young men turn to escapes and so they escape through different domains where they feel like they do have control uh or they do have an aim or you know then video games is is a major one these days and um mm-hmm. and you know i think video games can be amazingly instructive and and fun and beautiful and and so i'm not disparaging that but it's one mode that um young men particularly will turn to so that unconsciously so that they don't have to face this this felt sense of being wayward or lost and i think that's oftentimes the form it takes in my experience and in people that i work with and talk to um there's this sense of of feeling lost and i think it speaks to the greater crisis of meaning that our our world our culture experiences and that tapping into one's own source of meaning is a way of escaping that that trap is a way of escaping that that sense of being a boy um and is a way of claiming one's sovereignty and finding direction and purpose which ultimately i think is the hinge point um between the the boyhood way of living and the the manhood or, or the childhood and the adulthood is tapping into a sense of purpose where you're not just a passive recipient of what's happening you're a creator moving in the direction of something that is meaningful to you mhm mhm i love that so how do you facilitate that for others for me what it all boils down to is can you trust yourself because i don't have someone's answers and no no other person or institution or ideology i believe has anyone's answers they have to emerge authentically from within and so a pillar of my work is helping people to come into trust for themselves because if you can trust yourself and this is part of this overall alignment and it's a core aspect of it if you can trust yourself then you move through the world and every decision that you make you know that you're making the right decision if you take the time to reflect upon it because you check in with yourself <laughs> and you feel into your heart ultimately mhm and stay out of your ego yeah <laughs> because your heart will not lie to you and this yeah. is where you know loving everything yeah. if if you can rest back into the heart and trust yourself then you will not be led astray and sure you're still going to make mistakes and you're still going to end up in situations you don't want to be in that's inevitable but you will you will end up in a place that is far far better than what any other path will take you in and so i emphasize this aspect of things like trust yourself i don't have your answers nobody else has your answers <laughs> you do though yeah Each internally person does yeah. yeah yeah all the answers are within you mhm for sure yeah that's essentially what i also yeah have come to my own understanding my experience is a little bit different based upon the fact that you're you present as male and i present as female but um i as i was growing up i grew up with a parent who was very um instructive on how they wanted me to present in the world and who i wanted or what who they wanted me to be which was completely different than who i was inside mm. and so i spent my 20s and my 30s feeling incredibly lost and disconnected because i felt like there were two parts of me there was the part that everybody else expected me to be and how i was supposed to show up to that 
And then there was the part inside that was trying to make um, it all be okay, <laughs> for lack of a better description. And those two were always at odds. I mean, it wasn't man versus boy, but it literally was like a fake persona versus my truth, right? Mm. And going through this conversion process of really starting to grow that part of me, despite what that would, or the ripples that that would impact the rest of my life or the people around me, right? And having a lot of fear, I find that, you know, even with my clients or even with my friends or even with in conversation with people, that people have a lot of fear of change, right? Again, you know, that that I don't want to rock the boat or, you know, we've been married for 10 years and I don't want to be alone or, you know, but people don't want to speak to their truth. And I feel like, again, that, that goes to the concept of feeling incredibly disconnected. Like you're all alone here in this world mm. and that no one's really looking out for you and that, you know, um, no one really cares. Mm hmm. So for me, um, I try to cultivate truth as much as possible. I think that's the only way to really be honest about how I show up and how I present. Um, I think I'm maybe talking in a little bit of a circle here, but I guess my point is, is, you know, your experience reminds me of my own in some ways. And I think it's interesting that we both have decided to teach others what we had to find on our own. Yeah. Because it was a model to me. Yeah. yeah. I had to go through many resources to find this. Yeah. It was always here, but it was so afraid to share it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because again, I got the consistent message that that wasn't okay. That's not okay. That person is not okay. Mm. Yeah, please keep doing this. This is better. This works for me. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, this is working. Why do you need to change it? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think part of the path of trusting oneself is trusting the truth that each person is on his or her own path. Yes. And allowing them to walk their path rather than trying to force some vision of what I think this person should be doing. Yes. Yeah. That sovereignty, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not projecting my expectations on how you should show up in our relationship, just allowing someone else to be and that everyone's on a different part of their journey. And sometimes people don't want to do the work. Mm. So you have to, you know, essentially leave them behind or lose the relationship as you continue to grow. And that's also, you know, what people fear too, I find, right? Yeah. Is that if I change, then the people around me are going to have to change too. And what does that mean, right? That that, that relationship might end because that person has certain expectations for how I show up and I'm no longer looking in or living in my ego, I'm speaking from my heart now and that's gonna change things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Ooh, how do you notice and then liberate yourself from a state of disconnect, severance or self abandonment? Mm. So there, yeah, this, this state of disconnect, this state of self-abandonment is a common theme of our world. And it's interesting that on, in one sense, we're more interconnected with one another than ever. Yep. And at the same time, just looking at it from a different plane, we're more disconnected than ever. Yes. And I think there, some of the key forms this disconnection takes that I can see are it's disconnection from nature, uh, it's disconnection from community, it's disconnection from one's own inner sense or, or intuition or, or trust for oneself. Um, and 
it's disconnection from purpose or meaning. And these are major themes of disconnection that people are experiencing in this world we're living in right now. So, you know, the how do we address disconnection? It's simply through the opposite mode of, of connecting and mm-hmm. authentically connecting, mm-hmm. right? So that's intimacy. Yeah. Creating or cultivating intimacy yeah. with each other. That's yeah. a great way of putting it. And you can cultivate that intimacy with yourself and you can cultivate that intimacy with nature, immersing yourself in it and really exploring and participating with the flora and fauna, getting your hands in the dirt um, and that intimacy with community where there's this aspect of kind of the social media age where there is this impetus to present this front Mm -hmm. and that actually creates a a drag in the formation of true community. But when you get together with someone in person and you feel them and you get to sense them and exchange molecules with them, then it creates this real intimacy. And that is the seed from which a forest of community can blossom. Um, And so, yeah, I think intimacy is a, a, a great way of putting it because mm-hmm. to be intimate with something is to be very close. And to be close means that you're seeing up close. You're, you're able to examine up close and sense and feel up close. And that's, that's the opposite from being disconnected. Being mm-hmm. disconnected is being far flung and being out in space and not feeling that that actual tether to the other or not wanting to feel perhaps Mm -hmm. yeah i think um especially if you have a hard time feeling certain feelings Mm -hmm. what do you think or how do you feel um how do you what makes us sick you mentioned um somewhere in your i think your information that I originally found you on. You were talking to contributing contributing factors that makes us sick. And I have my own experience of that through overcoming an autoimmune condition, which I'm not going to discuss, but I certainly have my own opinions of what contributes to making us sick. But could you speak more to your own opinion of that? Yeah, so this is a theme that I explore in my writing where I I speak of culture sickness. So the way that I frame it is that we are living in a sick culture, which I, I emphasize that that's not a judgment that, oh, this culture's sick. It's not, it's not in that way. It's that our culture has a sickness. Yes. And so we, by virtue of existing and participating and ultimately being the makeup of this culture, we contract this sickness by living in it. And when I say sickness, I don't strictly mean physical ailments, although that's a form that that it takes. Um, Can certainly manifest as that. Yeah. And or mental ailments um, or, you know, uh, many other ailments, the the crisis of meaning or or any of these things can be attributed to this cultural sickness. And so what what do we do about that? Um, To me, it's ultimately it comes down to awareness, attention, you know, going back to this idea of the shadow, the things that we sweep under the rug of the shadow, they emerge in other ways. So what happens with the culture's shadow? We sweep things under the rug and sometimes, you know, it's just dust or 
food particles or whatnot, and maybe we're not noticing it as we're walking, walking over the rug, but sometimes we're sweeping a boulder under the rug and <laughs> we're going to trip on it. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's going to injure us in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the idea that facing everything with open eyes is the way that, you know, this idea that the way out is through or that, um, yeah, to, to see one's wholeness is to actually look at all of the aspects of us, including the shadow aspects, including the sickness. And if we're doing this on a personal scale, we're doing this on a cultural scale, uh, then there's nowhere for these aspects to hide. And if there's nowhere for them to hide, then we can start the work of integrating them. And to integrate oneself, then there's no room for sickness if you have all of the parts of yourself in harmonious alignment. And again, I, I speak of sickness not, not merely to say physical, physical illness. You mean how the world is impacting you? Yeah, and the ways that the world is failing us, the ways that the culture is failing us, the ways that it's teaching us these unhelpful or harmful lessons, the way that it's not addressing our true needs, the way that it's lending us to become disconnected, the way that it's not giving us uh, encouragement to step into our authentic selves. All of these litany of ways that we're being failed by this culture that, you know, human beings have created. And do you think there's a way out? To me, the way out is each person doing his or her own work. psychological work. Yeah. And that's the only way out because uh, in my opinion, no institution is going to save us. The state will not save us. No ideology is going to save us. These things can put band-aids over things if they're applied properly. But ultimately, what culture is, is the confluence of the actions of every individual within it. So if we're moving through the world and we're sick, we're perpetuating the sickness. And if we're getting ourselves into alignment, then we're affecting the field. Yeah. And we're creating stability in the field. We're creating harmony in the field. And simply by moving through the world, that impacts the people that we come into contact with. Because mm -hmm. we're not throwing our shadow stuff on other people. Yeah. <laughs> Projecting it. Yeah. Yeah. We're anchoring a sense of... Um, for lack of a better word, wholeness or health. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As we move about and that ripples out. Yeah. I agree. Mm. Yeah. It is discouraging though, because not everybody's doing it. Yeah. And that's the thing with sovereignty. It's like ultimately each person has to come to that choice on, on their own. Yeah. And we can encourage, we can invite, but we can't force someone to get into alignment, <laughs> you, <laughs> no. you know, and you wouldn't want to. Well, not everyone's even ready. Mm, yes. Sometimes, uh, you know, people don't even want to hear the truth. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I see it as we all have free will, right? We all have free will. And it's, it's the opportunity to practice non-attachment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As much as possible. Yeah. My ego gets involved all the time, but. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But mostly practicing non-attachment, mm -hmm. sharing what I know, sharing what I've um, learned if someone's open to it, but then also not having expectations that they take it in or that they even, you know, will do something with it. Yeah. And I think that grace is a big part of this having grace for ourselves because 
you know, I betray my myself all the time. And a big aspect of our culture right now is this finger pointing yeah. and this shaming. And I think that is profoundly unhelpful. Where do you uh, think that comes from? You think it's people's fear? You think it's fear and scarcity? Yeah, I think fear fear is a big part of it. I think it's, yeah, it's projection of shadow aspects of oneself that someone isn't able to or, or willing to look at. Um, and it's it's looking for an easy solution to an incredibly complex problem you're the you're the source of the issue i found you <laughs> okay that's done i can disregard you or sequester you and go about my business um but it's it's too facile it's too easy it doesn't account for the complexity of the human spirit and so grace i think has to be a component of working our way through this dire complex of predicaments that we find ourselves in mm -hmm. knowing that yeah i'm going to mess up i'm going to keep messing up you're going to keep messing up and that's okay <laughs> let's not make ourselves feel worse for messing up let's encourage one another and ourselves to get get back on the path well and also how do you not i mean how do you learn if you don't mess up yeah, yeah. I, I don't know anyone that's getting it 100% right all the time. Yeah, you can't. It's impossible. And it's an impossible standard to to suggest that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we explore parts of ourselves that we most often ignore? Mm. I think what it comes down to is the dichotomy between curiosity and judgment. So you, you mentioned curiosity earlier, and I think that's a key component of all of this because judgment and curiosity are opposite forces. They can't occupy the same space at the same time. Like fear and love. Right. So if we're in a state of curiosity, we're, open we're taking an open stance and we're taking an inquisitive stance versus in judgment we're taking a closed stance and we're taking a stance of i already know therefore any new information coming in is irrelevant and you're already wrong so why are we having this conversation right so if we can take a stance of curiosity with ourselves which you know, oneself is often the hardest person to to maintain that stance with. It's so easy to put judgment on ourselves and say I'm wrong or I'm bad or I'm stupid or all of these these um, ways of putting ourselves down or keeping ourselves limited. It's so easy to do that. Uh, but if we can inhabit a mode of curiosity, then we are opening up something in ourselves and we can peek under that rug that we've swept everything and not necessarily have to be afraid of it. We can say, hey, hey, little friend. <laughs> hey, <Boulder. laughs> yeah, yeah. Come out. I want to examine you. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You're okay. I'm okay. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see what's under here. Mm -hmm. Versus like, oh, I'm I'm terrible. Look at all these terrible things about me. I don't want to look at this. Uh, if I even go near the corner of this rug, I'm going to implode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why is love the key to integration? You know, love is this mysterious. Yeah, let's talk about love for a second. <laughs> yeah, it's this mysterious layer of existence. And it seems like everything comes back to it. Everything comes back to love 
uh, it's so pure. It's so pure. It feels so good. It's so right. It's we just we all have this intuitive understanding of love and its sacredness and the way that we cherish it and the way that we exalt it and it's it's in its own domain it's in its own category and it's the highest the highest thing that we can imagine it's a source of such great poetry and such great meaning and it's a very high vibration yeah it's (laughs) You know, I think it's the highest, the highest thing there is, is love. And it's so much has been said about it that it's hard to speak about it without falling into cliches. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, sometimes cliches are, are true because something that is so obvious is stated a lot (laughs) and so love is the the operative mode of healing it's the operative mode of interconnection of transcendence of limitation it's it's benevolence Mm -hmm. and it's Pretty much, it's always the answer. It's always the answer is love. What do I need to do in this situation? Whatever it may be, inject more love. That's pretty much always the answer. <laughs> it's really simple, right? We make it really complicated. Mm-hmm. Do you remember when that that simplicity came to you? I mean, I think it comes in in moments, in fleeting moments. And I think it's something we all know all the time, but... Was there an aha for you? I can't say that there was. I think it was more an accumulation of being kind of beat over the head with the same lesson over and over in life until I have no choice but to to face the truth of it. (laughs) Uh Yeah, that love is is the way and again it it sounds so so pedestrian or or so cliche to say that but but it's true (laughs) you can't argue with it it's just true yeah well i teach people or i say often that um i'm just showing you how to love the parts of yourself that are sprinkle in love Mm. in areas that just were never loved before. Either someone was too busy with their own emotions or, you know, um, too self-absorbed to be able to do that for you in that moment. And that's okay. But you showing up to do that now and recognizing that maybe that hasn't been done for you in the past, but that you can do that more often throughout your life is the key. I think the more that we can embrace, uh, again, all of the aspects of ourselves throughout the day and learn how to love aspects of ourselves that maybe weren't loved in our family or weren't loved by our partners or weren't loved by our friends, because ultimately it comes down to us learning how to love that about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, truly. Because I have to live in this body nobody else does and um yeah i i that's that's the best way i can describe taking responsibility for how i show up again yeah is by having more love and compassion for all of the parts of myself that are still wounded and still showing up yeah because i can't i can't get rid of that you know and i don't even think that's the goal as I get older, I realize like <clears throat> it's not about trying to rid myself of the things that um, are 
seen as unhealthy or seen as unproductive. It's more about how can I love those aspects of myself when they're presenting so that I can shift into more productive ways of being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, let's see, what did we not cover? Oh, so you talked about healing at one point and that love is the key to healing, right? So I've found, and I don't know if this is your experience either, but sometimes the reason why we don't heal is because we don't feel safe, safe in our bodies or safe in our environment, right? And healing has to take place in a safe environment. You have to have stability. You have to have a safe vessel or someone to hold your hand or someone, you know, to show you what safety is, or you'd have to find safety within yourself. And a lot of times we haven't been shown that. So how do you cultivate a sense of safety within or, yeah. Yeah, I think safety is one of the key pillars of the whole project that we're talking about. And it's interesting that we live in a world where, you know, by and large, of course, you can make arguments, but by and large... We're not safe. Well... <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, let's be real. <laughs> well, what I was going to say was we are probably materially, physically more safe, us beings on this planet at this time overall than any other previous time Generation. in history. Generation, yeah. And which isn't to say there isn't great suffering and, and great danger and um, deprivation and all of these things, of course. That's an aspect of our world, but just looking at it from a historical perspective, and yet we are seeing and experiencing this, at least in recent years, this great increase in these mental health maladies and, and things like anxiety and depression and PTSD. And, and so what is going on here? You know, I can... I can conjecture or imagine back in our distant, distant past, our ancestors who lived on the plains and lived in the wild and uh, lived a nomadic lifestyle. And it was, there's probably a lot of anxiety in that way of living uh, when you didn't know if some predator was going to, you know, run away with your child mm -hmm. or, you know, you break your leg and that's the end of your story. Mm -hmm. um, so there was probably, I imagine, great anxiety in that way of being. And in some sense, the whole cultural project is a way of not having to worry about getting eaten by a lion. <laughs> And I'm, I'm being tongue in cheek when I say that, but there, there's also truth in it. Like we have created this infrastructure so that we can control as many variables as we can so that we can feel safe and not be subject to the whims of wild nature. And yet, and yet we are more anxious than, than ever, maybe, you know, uh, uh, but so what's going on here? Yeah. What is going on here? Because I don't imagine somebody on the plains couldn't get out of bed. Mm. I mean, I'm sure it existed. Don't get me wrong, but, um, definitely less than now. I yeah. Maybe that comes down to our own disconnection. Yeah. I think it's, it's in part, everything that we've been talking about, the whole swirl of the elements of of this cultural sickness that are afflicting us, but safety, you asked about safety. Yeah. I think that's uh, a core piece of all of this. Um, and there, there are different ways to feel safe, feeling safe physically, feeling safe emotionally. Um, of course, they're all crucial 
if I can feel safe, for example, in conversation with my partner, like if I can feel safe not having to worry about um, how she's going to respond to something vulnerable that I have to say, or rather worry that it's going to be there's going to be uh, an attack or a backlash, then I can actually be true and vulnerably express what I'm feeling. And so if my lover comes to me and says, you know, there's something really bothering me that I need to talk about, if I tense up and get ready to get into attack mode uh, and whatever she's saying, I'm making it about me and creating this this pattern or this way of being she's not going to feel safe to bring things up with me and therefore we're creating this this field of unsafety and people like you talked about earlier you felt like you for so long you carried this aspect of you that Um, you couldn't be your authentic self Mm -hmm. because it didn't feel safe to be that. Mm -hmm. And so we want to create a world in which people feel safe to be their authentic selves and they can sing the song that their heart wants to sing Mm -hmm. and they don't have to worry about uh, the judgment or the slings and arrows. And we can bring about this, this collective sense of safety that we can all participate in. And if we're feeling safe, then we don't have to have our guard up. And if we don't have our guard up, then the people we interact with will feel safe because, oh, this person doesn't have his guard up. I don't need to have my guard up. There's not gonna be a war here. So again, it's all, if we can carry ourselves in a way, then that way impacts the whole field. And if many, many of us are doing this, then we're creating this web. And in in this way, we're creating a web of safety. And then when people are safe, they can express how they truly are and not fear that it's going to be shamed or disparaged. And if we can go beyond even just safety to celebration, like, I want your full expression of your being, please, like I invite that, then we're bringing that, that connection back and we're, we're bringing that, that uh, field of authenticity into being. So how do you cultivate safety if you have never felt safe? Whew. That's a... Yeah, that's a question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, were you fortunate enough to feel safe in your home, which is potentially how you learned it, right? Yeah, in in all of the major ways, yes. Of course, there were ways that I didn't. Um, but in in all of the major ways, yes, I, I felt very safe and very loved by my parents. And uh so, yeah, of course, the people who have a foundation of what being safe, safe feels, feels like, like are going to be able to hold that that pillar of safety more easily than people who have no foundation of what being safe feels like. Mm-hmm. Do you ever come across that with the people that you work with? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any advice for anyone who doesn't feel safe, how they could cultivate that more in their experience? Hmm. Well, doing what one can to put oneself into a position of safety, you know, that's pretty broad to to say, but, um, if you're, you know, if you're in a lion's den, then you want to leave the lion's den. It's going to be less likely that the lion pounces on you. you. Mm-hmm. But 
you know, there's so many complications with this. Like some people can't get out of an unsafe situation. And so what do they do? I mean, we always have the refuge in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. But even that can be challenging to access if we're constantly activated in our limbic system and feeling like at any moment I might have to get up and flee. It's really a challenging question. It is. I agree. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any <laughs> insider <laughs> wisdom that I hadn't come across. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's very, very challenging. Um, okay. So how can we take more responsibility for the thriving of all beings? Yeah. I think that's, that's at the core of this entire discussion. And the way I think about it is that it is my responsibility. Every, every person's thriving is my responsibility. Every person's thriving is your responsibility. Is this person's like, it's on each, each one of us. Mm -hmm. This is a theme in, in Dostoevsky and the, yeah. the brothers Karamazov, um, that, each is responsible for all. And I think that book is a beautiful explication and exploration of that idea um, very, very thoroughly and beautifully. But I think it's absolutely true that it is my responsibility. Everything that happens is my responsibility. And that may sound absurd to say. It may sound absurd to say. But I think... I believe it's true because again, we're so internetworked in so many profound ways that whatever I do moving through the world is impacting every, everyone. everything. Yeah. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Cause right. everything has energy. Yeah. And in large and small ways, you know, of course the people that I'm surrounded with are going to be most impacted by my behavior, but then there's people they're surrounded with and it just trickles out and out and out and out. And, you know, I can, if I am in traffic and I lay on my horn and flip somebody off, like that could send their day down a path that everyone they're getting into contact with is now feeling that anger or shame or whatever it may be. We're so internetworked. So the way I think of it is it is both an honor and a burden. It's both at the same time. And even a privilege. Yeah. Right. That everything that happens is on is on us, is on me, is on you, is on each individual one of us. It's such a burden. It's such a weight to carry because it's like, God, I have to deal with everything going on in my own life. And I need to think about how it's affecting everything. everyone else. That's so much to ask. But we're all in it together. Right. Right. And so at the same time that it's this tremendous burden, it's the greatest honor because I actually have the ability to change the world. I can actually change things by bringing myself into as great of an integration as I can and then just moving through the world. I can actually change everything by picking up that responsibility. So it's such a great honor at the same time because it it brings this sense of of power into one's being like i i am not powerless in the face of the great tragedy of life i actually have control over my own sovereignty and thereby i can impact everything it's so beautiful it really is isn't it when you get that mhm mm yeah mhm mm thank you Thank you for sharing everything that you shared today. And thank you for your wisdom. And I appreciate um, your insight deeply to all of these different aspects. I look forward to having future conversations with you. And um, thank you for sharing everything with everyone who's watching or listening. You're welcome. And thank you, Andrea. It was a real joy. You're so welcome.